Okay, hi everyone. Um, I want to discuss one final piece with you. And after I just uh, uploaded a few videos on Jonathan Franzen's piece uh, about Alzheimer's, his piece, My Father's Brain, and this narrative conception of the self, I want to end with another large theme um, besides the self but related to that notion of what a self is. And the theme involves uh, something nobody likes to talk about, I, I take it, but it involves death. And I've asked you to read this chapter. The chapter comes from a book which is just called Death. It is from this philosopher, Todd May. And the chapter uh, is the middle chapter of the book. The book has only three chapters. It's not terribly long. It's about 120 pages or so. And the chapter that I asked you to read is the middle chapter called Death and Immortality. But in order to discuss that, I want to say just a few things from what May discusses in the first chapter of the book that I didn't ask you to read, uh, so that you understand a little bit better what he's suggesting in the second chapter that I did ask you to read. And so I want to start off this way, with a few thoughts. One is this. I take it that if you were, maybe when you first signed up for Intro to Philosophy, uh, maybe if you told somebody you signed up for Intro to Philosophy, they might ask, well, what did, what do you think you're going to talk about in there? What kinds of questions might you ask? And I think the characterization or stereotype of philosophers that they're going to ask questions like, well, what's the meaning of life? And sometimes when people ask it that way, uh, it seems like a kind of cliche almost. As if, well, there couldn't possibly be one meaning to life. Nobody has an answer to that. It's a perennial question, but nobody knows how to answer it. And that's fine. But... I want to get at that question not because I'm going to provide an answer to it, that would be absurd, I take it, but in a different way, which is this. How can we even ask that question? Or why do we ask that question? What's the meaning of life? And I take it it's because the meaning of life, if there is one, isn't obviously preset or pre-given. And that part of the reason that we can even ask or entertain the question is because we are the kinds of beings that die and not just that die, but we know it. Or if it's not quite knowledge, we're surely aware that we die. And you might think back to when you were a child, perhaps, and ask yourself, well, what was maybe the first experience or first awareness that you had that you too might die one day, or that you will die one day? And ask what kinds of feelings you might have had when that frightening and terrifying thought came upon you. This notion that we die and that we know it or that we're aware of it might start to offer another kind of theory of who we are or ourself that separates us, perhaps. This is uh, part of May's view. It might separate us from other animals, not because other animals don't die, but because they might not know or be aware of it in the same way that we are, that we know about our own deaths. And so one of the things that May wants to suggest and briefly, he's taking these thoughts uh, from some other philosophers, including in particular this philosopher Martin Heidegger. In this uh, magnum opus from Heidegger from 1927 called Being and Time. May takes it that he's giving something of a gloss in these uh, first two chapters of his book on some themes from being in time that Heidegger uh, illustrates back in 1927. And so in order to understand those themes, I want to go through a couple of them that May identifies in order to suggest that the fact that we die and that we know it might really be the most important fact about who we are. Not that there aren't lots of other important facts about who we are, and about our lives and how our lives go. But that even if there are plenty of other important facts about us, 
maybe, you know, who we end up marrying, uh, the kind of life, life that we lead with that other person, um, the lives that we might spend with our friends or our family, our jobs, and so on. Those are all important factors of who we are. But he suggests that the most important fact about who we are, more important than all those other facts, is that we die and that we know it. And one reason for that is that our deaths, he suggests, extinguish all of those other facts about us. And in that way, death is all-encompassing and all-powerful. In a way that those other facts, though important, are not all-encompassing and all-powerful. And so, in order to see this, May has a particular conception of death following Heidegger in mind. And these are what he calls the four themes of death. Again, this is from a chapter I'm not asking you to read. It's from chapter one. These are the four themes. The first is that death is the end of us. Uh, that's the, the end of us and of our experience. That it's senseless to talk about an us or an I apart from the experiences that we are having, that we are enjoying in the world, that we're privy to. The second is that death is a, he calls it a stoppage, or a kind of cutting off. And what he has in mind here is this, he wants to deny that death is kind of any kind of aim or goal or overall purpose in life. And to say it that way is to, to, to put it like this, maybe there's a kind of analogy. He draws on this uh, in chapter one. Sometimes when we discuss our lives, even narratively, we sometimes talk about them as if they're chapters of a book, of a novel perhaps. That we, reflecting upon our, our, the past portions of our life, we're thinking about where it is that we want our futures to go. We'll talk about certain facets of those lives, certain segments as if they were chapters. Uh, maybe parts of your childhood, where it is that you grew up or where you lived. Uh, if you uh, were in a relationship with certain people or a certain person. Um, if you took on a certain job and then moved on to another job if you were at a particular high school and then on to college and so on. We talk about these as if they're different chapters, as if they're forming a kind of novel about our lives. And it's not that that is completely wrong, but May suggests that as an analogy, it's kind of incomplete or incorrect even. Why? Because it's often the case, at least with traditional modern novels, not all novels, but at least some genre of novel, that there's a kind of completion to the lives of the characters constituting those novels. Whereas in our lives, as we experience them, it's not as if our lives, he thinks, in most circumstances, come to some kind of complete whole at the end. Rather, it's the case that our lives are just cut off. And that's what constitutes, or that's what shapes death. And it's a cutting off of all of our relationships, of all of our commitments, of all the projects that we were engaged in and wanted to continue as we were going throughout our lives. And in that way, it's like scissors cutting a thread instead of that thread coming to a kind of hole and making a specific kind of shape in our lives. And so this is the second theme of death, that it's a cutting off or a stoppage instead of an achievement of a goal. The third theme is that death seems to have a couple of aspects here. That it's inevitable, and yet also uncertain. Which might at first glance seem paradoxical, but it's not. When May suggests, following Heidegger, that death is inevitable and uncertain, what he means is that it's inevitable in the sense that we know that it will happen at some point. But it's uncertain in the sense that we just don't know when. 
it could be 50 years from now, it could be 30, it could, if tragedy strikes, be tomorrow. And what that does is, if death has both of these qualities and both of them together, what that means is that death haunts us throughout our entire lives in virtue of making that uncertainty and the inevitability. It makes our lives quite fragile. Because we know somewhere in the back of our minds, even though we don't like to think about it very often, that in principle, any day could be our last. Even if we all hope to live to you know, 78.6 years, or whatever the American average is, uh, or perhaps longer, we know that we're always fragile and vulnerable to, uh, to death itself. The last theme of death is this, and this relates to what I said in, uh, at the start. It seems like in virtue of these three themes, the first three, that death provokes a kind of wonder. Wonder about what? Well, specifically what I said a few minutes ago. Wonder about whether our lives have any meaning at all. If it seems like it can just be so arbitrary and meaningless, that we could die in, on any given day, if it's a stoppage or a cutting off, if it's the end of us. And so in provoking wonder, it helps give an explanation of why it is that we even bother to ask this question, does life have any meaning? If we can uh, be cut off in any given second, in principle. So those are some of the themes that I may identify as concerning death, following Heidegger and being in time. By the time he gets to chapter two, which I asked you to read, he wants to take up a certain kind of possibility. And it's a way he thinks that we either neglect these themes or try to circumvent them. And it's in this thought that we sometimes have about whether it is that we can be immortal. Because if we can be immortal, it seems as though death is not the end of us. It's not a stoppage. Um, it's not it's not inevitable that we die. And we have these themes in different ways throughout our culture and various cultures. Whether it's an immorta immortality in an afterlife, whether it's a kind of fountain of youth idea, or some other related idea about living on past our deaths. And so to take up the thought of immortality, what May wants to do is try to think about immortality in its best case scenario. Because he wants to know something. Would immortality, if it were achievable, if we could somehow have it, would it even be desirable? That's one question. Another question is, to what degree is immortality even imaginable? for beings like us who are mortal. And so I'm going to start a new video in just a moment. But I want to just preview the answer that he gives to both of these questions. So the first one, would immortality be desirable? The answer that May suggests is no. That it wouldn't be desirable. To the answer, to what degree is immortality imaginable? Well, May suggests here that we need to work through a kind of thought experiment about what immortality might be like, if it's going to be anything like our lives here on Earth, as we know them. And it runs up against limits of our ability to imagine what an immortal life would be like. And what that shows us, May thinks, is that if we run up against certain kinds of limits about our ability to imagine what an immortal life would be like, what that actually shows us is it strengthens the view that death is the most important fact about us because it shapes not just how our lives go, but it actually constrains our imagination uh, in an, a very powerful way, in an ontological way. And so I want to take up both those questions uh, again in the next video.